guys and welcome to How to Gastro. In today's video, we're going to be talking about a very interesting disease and that is nastosomiasis. So let's get started. So what is nastostomiasis? Nastostomiasis is caused by an infection with the parasitic roundworm called nastostoma spinigerum and rarely nastostoma hispidum, which infect vertebrate animals. So vertebrate animals are all animals which have a backbone, and that's the vast majority of all the animals that we see on land. The disease is most commonly found in the Asian continent, although some cases have been recorded in South and Central America and in Africa. So from this definition of nastostomiasis, we get that it's an infection which is caused by this parasitic roundworm. And there's two main subtypes of this worm that both belong to the nastostoma species. And these two species are called nastostoma spinigerum. And in very rare cases of infection, we can also find the parasite nastostoma hispidum. So the disease is actually very common in countries in Asia, but some cases have been reported in South and Central America and also in Africa. So in this image below is actually a picture of what this parasitic roundworm looks like. And this is actually several images of the Nastoma spinigerum species. So now that we know what the basics of Nastostomiasis is, let's take a closer look at how one can contract this disease. So Nastostomiasis is actually a foodborne parasitic disease. And this means that the infection occurs in humans after one ingests larvae, which can be found in raw or undercooked protein food sources, mainly raw fish, shrimp, crab, frogs, eels, birds, reptiles, or even chicken. So if we take a closer look at this image on the right side of my screen, it actually shows us what the life cycle of the nasostoma parasite actually looks like. So we'll begin at number one, and here it says we have the unembryonated eggs, which are passed in the feces, and these come from the various vertebrate animals which are infected. And the egg actually embryonates in the water, and we have the egg which hatches and release these larvae. And this actually infects the first host, which is the intermediate host, which ingests the larvae. And these larvae will actually molt twice to an early L3 stage. And this will actually grow into an advanced stage and actually infiltrate the tissue of the second or intermediate host. And these includes frog and fish. So from this, we have the infection of the second or intermediate host, which is ingested by the definitive host. So now we have the infection of these cats, dogs, pig, which actually ingest these various food sources. Or we can also move to a paratenic host, which actually includes birds or chickens or snakes, etc. So various type of reptiles. And then we have the humans, which ingest these immature adult version of the parasites. And they actually undergo aberrant migration in the human host. And this is actually what the cross-sectional image looks like of the parasite infiltrating the body and actually creating something called a nastoma. And so this is how the cycle continues. So humans are actually capable of being infected at various stages of the cycle because if we ingest raw or undercooked protein food sources, which actually imply all of these various animals, the raw fish, the shrimp, the crab, the frog, the eel, the birds, or even the chicken, we can contract the disease. So now that we know how one can contract this disease, let's take a closer look at some signs and symptoms of this disease. So the interesting thing about this disease is that any organ system may be involved, but the most common manifestation of the infection is localized intermittent migratory swellings in the skin and the subcutaneous tissues. And such swellings may be painful, pruritic, which means itchy, and or arithmetous, which means red. So we actually have these migratory swellings which appear, as we can see here in these various arrows. And this usually occurs in the skin or in the subcutaneous tissue of the patient. And this is actually a telltale sign or a giveaway sign of this disease. So within the 24 to 48 hours after the ingestion of the larvae, the larvae will begin to invade the gastric wall and cause eosinophilia and various other symptoms. So eosinophilia means that we have an increase in these eosinophils in the blood. So the eosinophils are a type of white blood cells that usually get increased in the blood when we are exposed to a parasite. 
or is the body's basic response to a parasitic infection. So this is very helpful in the diagnosis as well of the disease because we have this hyper eosinophilia within 24 to 48 hours after the ingestion of this larvae. So the clinical features of the patient's symptoms can include generally malaise, fever, utricaria, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and epigastric pain. And then their skin will most commonly show the migratory nodular paniculitis, soft tissue eruptions, boils, and nodules in one or several areas. In their pulmonary or respiratory system, the patient will experience cough, chest pain, dyspnea, or hemoptysis. And hemoptysis means the coughing up of fresh blood. And the patient may also cough up a worm. In the genitourinary tract, the patient may show hematuria, which is the passing of fresh blood in the urine, or urinary retention, meaning that they can't go to the bathroom, their urine just stores in their bladder. The patient may also suffer ophthalmological conditions, and they may have decreased visual acuity, blindness, photophobia, pain, uveitis, iritis, intraocular hemorrhages, and raised intraocular pressure, as well as retinal scarring or detachment. The hearing system can also be affected, and this may cause decreased hearing and or tinnitus, which is like buzzing in the ear. And finally, the central nervous system is another system that may be involved. And here the patients may experience radiculomyelitis, encephalitis, which means the inflammation of the brain, meningitis, which is the inflammation of the meninges or the outer covering of the brain. They will also suffer from neuritic pain, which is followed by a paralysis or decreased sensation for several days. And they may also suffer from cranial nerve palsies, a stiff neck, and evidence of a raised intracranial pressure. So as we can see, the signs and symptoms are actually quite vast because of this parasite's ability to infect multiple organ systems. So now that we know what the signs and symptoms of the disease look like, let's take a closer look at how one can diagnose this disease. So the primary form of diagnosis of nastostomiasis is the identification of the larvae in the skin tissue with microscopy. So if we take a closer look at this image down below, this is what the microscopic diagnosis of this disease looks like. So it says in the speech bubble, diagnostic characters for nastoma include the presence of large lateral cords, multinucleate intestinal cells, pigmented granular material in the intestinal cells and the presence of spines on the cuticle, so that we can see very well the spines on the cuticle, especially near the anterior end of the worm. So this cross-sectional microscopic image is actually taken from a subcutaneous nodule above the right breast of a patient showing the esophagus. And we must note the presence of the cuticular spines, which is shown in the arrow, and that's here. And this is actually a very important giveaway that can help us to diagnose this infection. So the blood test, as we mentioned earlier, will show hyper eosinophilia. The urine analysis will show hematuria, which is the presence of blood in the urine, and the worms may also be seen in the urine. The sputum examination may reveal a worm. As we said earlier, the patient may cough up a worm. And the plain x-ray may show pulmonary lobe consolidation, collapse, effusions, pneumothorax or hydropneumothorax. And finally, let's talk about the treatment of nastostomiasis. So the only definitive treatment is actually the surgical removal of the worm, and this is possible only when it is superficial and accessible. In addition to surgical excision, albendazole and ivermectin have been noted in their ability to eliminate the parasite. So the superficial worms will be surgically removed, and the worms that cannot be seen on the surface or that may have infiltrated the various organ systems of the patient will have to be treated medically with albendazole and ivermectin. And that brings us to the end of this video on nastostomiasis. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you found the presentation very interesting and informative. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe and share. And please make sure you turn on your bell notifications so you'll be notified every time we have a new upload. If you'd like to download a copy of this presentation, you may do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.